Hello and welcome to Arise America. I'm Debbie Turner Bell. Senator John McCain makes a sneak trip into Syria to meet with rebel troops fighting the Assad regime. And the collapse of an interstate highway bridge is a wake up call for the entire nation, according to the chairman of the National Transportation Safety Board. And the president and the governor take two. Obama goes to New Jersey to get a Superstorm Sandy update from Chris Christie. I'm Andrew Schmertz in Business News. Traders return after a long weekend looking to turn the market around. And if you're a college grad or you know one, you're going to want to watch these tips to enter the job market. We have all that and more right now on Arise America. Broadcasting live from the heart of New York City to the U.S. and across the globe, this is Arise America. Senator John McCain made a surprise visit to Syria this Memorial Day. His trip comes as the U.S. is trying to negotiate a diplomatic resolution to the two-year-long battle between the Syrian government and rebel fighters, hoping to overthrow President Bashir al-Assad. Senator John McCain crossed the border from Turkey into Syria to meet with military commanders waging war against the Bashar al-Assad regime. The woman who helped set up the visit says McCain made the trip because he believes the U.S. has abandoned the rebel fighters. She says he wanted to show them the American people support their war. It's a sentiment McCain himself hinted at this weekend. The United States is not leading or assisting. But the Obama administration is looking for a diplomatic end to the war. Secretary of State John Kerry met with his Russian counterpart in Paris to discuss next month's Syrian peace conference in Geneva. We are committed to this. We both want to make this conference happen. It's not an easy task. It's a very tall order. But McCain wants the U.S. to first implement a no-fly zone over Syria to change the situation on the ground. Unless Bashar Assad is convinced that the battlefield situation will not be in his favor. In other words, if he believes he can survive, I do not believe that he will seriously negotiate. The opposition fighters could soon have more support. Late last night, the European Union voted to allow member nations to ship weapons to Syria's outgun rebels. With us this morning to discuss Syria is Arise News foreign policy contributor Brian Palmer. Brian, we got a lot to talk about. Of course, we've been saying this almost every day for the last several weeks. Syria's been in this civil war for two years. Over right. 70,000 people uh, have been killed already, millions of refugees. Yes. What's the international community doing to stop this? It's really hard to know where to start, Debbie, because there's so much going on now. So we can start with the great powers. Um, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry is holding a round of meetings. He's met with Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. He's going to be meeting with the King of Jordan tomorrow. He's uh, going to be, uh, he's met with the French Foreign Minister. Basically, they're trying to bring the different parties to the table. President Bashar al-Assad has agreed to come to the table. And uh, the Syrian National Coalition, which hopefully would be the other party, is still trying to become a coalition, basically. So they have a lot of things to deal with, their leadership, new membership, um, and they're still in a bit of a disarray. So they haven't uh, even responded to whether or not they're going to be in this international peace conference. And there's a lot of disagreement. Let's talk about what they did agree on, and that is to uh, hold in place most of the embargoes. However, there was um, disagreement on whether or not to lift the ban of arms. Sort of parse through that. Well, um, that's a big thing. The European Union had a gathering of its foreign ministers. 25 out of 27 didn't want to lift the arms embargo. The UK and the France put pressure on the other folks. So now it seems that the embargo is no longer in place, or at least it's, it's weakened, to the degree that the door is open for France and the UK to transfer weapons to the Syrian... Um, to the rebels. To the rebels, to mm -hmm. the Syrian rebels, which on the one hand you have people saying that's just adding fuel to the fire, it's going to cause more violence, but then you have people saying, well, the people getting burned by the fire now are the Syrian rebels. So at least level the playing field, allow them to have weapons to fight back. So, Let's take this one piece at a time and, okay. and concentrate on the lifting of the, uh, the ban of the arms, which allows France, other countries, UK, right. to provide arms to the rebels, which is good news for them. I read a, a report uh, this morning in the paper that said, you know, we don't want pizza. 
we need arms. Right. So that's good news for them. The bad news is that this might embolden Russia to provide more arms to the Assad regime. Well, Russia has committed to selling air defense weapons, air defense missiles to the Assad regime, and they have said that they're going to go through with that because that will uh, sort of deter intervention. So you got to wonder about that. We're bringing the different parties to the peace table. You have the U.S. Uh, uh, really and the EU against the transfer of this weapon system to the Assad regime, and then on the other hand, you have the Russians saying they have to have it. So one wonders how much common ground there is for peace, for a transitional government, uh, for a cessation of the hostilities. I think we're still quite a bit away from an international peace conference. Yeah, it is a two-edged sword, no pun intended. And then to add into this muddled mess is Senator John McCain from Arizona making his own trip, a surprise trip going across the border from Turkey into Syria. I don't even know what to ask about this. What do you make of this, first of all? Uh, he's getting mavericky again. <laughs> um, John McCain has been an advocate of selling weapons to the Syrian resistance and establishing a no-fly zone uh, over Syria. You establish a no-fly zone, that means planes might get shot down, and you have war. So I think the Obama administration has been a little bit reluctant to do a number of those things. Now, as we've said before, there are still U.S. weapons getting to the Syrian resistance. That's just not something we talk about because that's sort of in the... Um, secret realm of things. And you know, what we don't know is whether or not McCain went over with the blessing of the Obama administration or in spite of some discouragement to go. So is, does he have the potential to help or to hurt? Wow, I would say. <laughs> you know, I mean... <laughs> that's the that's, question though, right? I think, I think that's a massive question. I mean, John McCain self-styled maverick. It takes a lot of logistics to make something like this happen. So I don't know whether U.S. support was involved, but one has to ask the question. Does it make things more complicated? It depends upon what the Obama administration's strategy is. It's like a tip of the iceberg. There's what they say and there's what they're, what, what they're actually doing. McCain could be part of that iceberg that's below the water, but I don't know. I think maybe some of that will come out in the wash. Yeah, I tend to think he's doing this just in and of his own heart because he has been obviously critical of how the Obama mm -hmm. administration yes. has approached this complex. Let's go back to the peace talk just one more time before we move on. And, and that is, of course, this is supposed to be in the middle of June, so supposedly will come up in the next two or three weeks. So do the recent, recent actions, the actions of the UE, John McCain, even uh, Kerry's meeting, uh, does, does all of this make this peace summit uh, likely to be set up to succeed or set up to fail? I think there, there are so many parties who are involved in this. You have the Assad regime, you have Iraq, you have Iran, you have Hezbollah, you have Israel, you have the Russians who are about to sell a missile system to the Assad regime, you have the, the U.S. who is against that. So I'd say... If I were a gambling man, I'm not sure I would gamble on the success of these talks, but I think it would be a good thing if they could get the different parties to the table. I think that would be the start of something, but I don't know. I really don't. All right, let's turn uh, the page a little bit, talk a little about some other, uh, some other action happening out there. There were five people, I believe, that were killed in an attack attributed or claimed responsibility by Al-Shabaab. Yes. What's Al-Shabaab been up to, and uh, has it been escalating, briefly. Al-Shabaab has been targeting this one particular town, Garissa, for a very long time. Um, Kenya invaded southern Somalia because of the instability on the border. Al-Shabaab has been doing the sort of sporadic um, attacking. The people who live there are actually, um, they are terribly critical of al Al-Shabaab because they're killing their people, but they also want the government to do more. What's interesting is that some of the civilians have organized among themselves. So you have Muslim citizens in Garissa who have created patrols to guard the churches. Mm -hmm. So you have these Muslim men running patrols around churches as they're holding services. So that I find is a positive sign, but Al-Shabaab is a big dangerous force. U.S. heavily involved in trying to limit their access. U U.S. actually has um, a secret base in uh, Kenya, which is about 200 miles away from this city called Garissa. So 
we're involved. Okay, well, you're going to come back and talk more about Syria. I know we'll pick up there with that and even other news going on out there. Brian Palmer, thank you as always. Thank you. See you soon.